Hello and welcome along to the VMTV Rugby Pod. What an opening round of Six Nations we had last weekend. Three away wins. Obviously the big one for us. Ireland winning in France. Bonus point in Marseille. Matt, you were there. How good was it? That was phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, I, I, I had a glass of wine with Quinny and a lot of the, the old and the bold after the game. And I asked all of them, Rory Best and Tommy Bow and some of the old commentators around, did anyone see five tries to one to Ireland? And no one saw that. We all thought Ireland had a show. If they could, you know, keep the crowd quiet, score the points. But the absolute dominance of the Irish team, and, and without taking anything away from that dominance, the, 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 the really poor lack of energy and lack of cohesion from the French, the whole night was a surprise at both sides. How wonderful Ireland played. And, and but also how poor France were, and and it, that's reflected in the in the in the positive for Ireland. They didn't take their foot off the throat of the French. They didn't like to think we've had enough. They denied themselves kicking for penalty, kick for touch, mauled. They beat them everywhere. They beat them at the mall. They beat them at the line out. The line out that was we said was in trouble, and it was during the World Cup. Paul O'Connell got it going again. It was magnificent. They won a couple of uh, French line outs. And apart from one scrum, which was just after the French replacement front row came in about the 50-minute mark, I think, when he would, I think it was about 50-minute mark, where Ireland gave away a penalty, uh, I, I thought they dominated every aspect of the play. Sean um, Edwards, the defensive coach for France, came on and said that they were dominated at the breakdown, and I think it was 13-2, the turnovers. Don't quote me exactly on that. I've got that number, but I'm pretty certain that's what he said. Like, on every aspect, it was incredible. And, and obviously... The two young players that came out, McCarthy, uh, uh, played so, so well. And uh, Jack Crowley, you know, after some, some errors, um, showed real mental strength and recovered and kicked a couple of crackers from the sideline and, and steered the team around the field pretty well. And when you talk about a 10, if you're saying your team scored five tries, your 9 and 10 have to have played pretty well. Obviously, the pack lays it down, but the 9 and 10 have to play well. Bundiaki, Magic, who didn't play well? There was no one. They all had... Really great games. <clears throat> in and Alan will, I hope, will back me up on this. In an absolutely ferocious atmosphere before the game, the national anthems were just mad. You know, the French national anthem was incredible. So, you know, a, a, a great, great day to be a supporter of the Irish team. And we're going to a 7 1 split next Sunday <laughs> against Italy, Matt. <laughs> Unless you warn me up, Steve, No, no, i got to keep keep going Thanks. with a 7 1 split against Italy. Uh, on a serious point, and that is a serious point, but Alan. Um, the 6 no 2 split called, was brilliant yeah, as well, well genuinely. It, it was brilliant, I know that, but no one called that result really, did they, Alan? Like, I know we, you said. What do you mean nobody called no, that result? Didn't. Matt Williams and myself. Oh, yeah, we, the three of us yeah, did. We, we said Ireland would win last okay. week. We went for three oh, away oh, wins. Oh, okay, oh, but like, by that margin, come on. Of course, of course. Yeah, you know. No, look, I. Minute one, the eighty. They would it be fair to say they dictated the game. Yes, yeah. they did. Yeah, I think they started the game superb, and and Matt knows that as a coach or as a player. Anybody going to France, whether you're with your province or your country, um, whether you're with the under twenties or whatever team you're with, the women's teams, whatever. If you, the last thing you want to do going to France is start badly, and the opposition get their tails up because that's just the temperament of the French sports people when they get the crowd behind them and they build confidence, they can be phenomenal because they have incredible athletes, all their sports teams and it's a massive country, the profile of people they can pick in their in their teams. Um, they're very athletic always. Um, so if they get confidence, get self-belief and historically going back when I started with Munster in, in 96, 97 season, going down to France, you know, that was, that would, we had some harsh lessons earlier on. Um, you're half asleep for the first 10 minutes. You're waiting for players around you to do something and suddenly you're 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 standing on your post two or three times in the first 10, 15 minutes. And it's um, it's crazy. So, obviously things have changed and I think Drico changed that whole narrative in 2000, didn't he, Matt, with those three tries. That was a big line in the sand about with Irish sports people. You know, it isn't about kicking the ball up in the air anymore and, and hoping for the best and hoping for a bit of luck and, and stifling the opposition. We've seen a great transition, but we've seen a kind of a self-confidence and self-belief that, you know, you have to, the mental side of it is important. We're still a very small rugby nation. 
we're still going to be tarnished with never being beyond the quarter final. Um, but I think what this team proves last Friday night is there's exceptional players here and they haven't gone away. And it's exciting in a sense that, you know, we've, you know, Calvin Nash comes in, Jack Crowley starts, Joe McCarthy. There's three players now who were involved in a historic win here. Biggest winning margin ever. So that kind of gives you great hope that the transition of this group and getting a few more young players in, that'll that'll evolve naturally. But Friday night was big. So they started well. You said it there, Stuart, from the word go. And, you know, you get a certain feel um, in commentary that, you know, maybe I'm a pessimist sometimes. I get criticised online for any of the... I think I had three or four people critiquing me at the weekend that I was a bit negative on Ireland and, and you know, I'm nearly a France supporter at times the way that I was talking France. I, I can't... I didn't listen back to my commentary, but I, sh- I was sure from the word go that I was praising Ireland for the way they started and the ability to come out in the field, the body language, the execution, the bravery in a sense. You're not in your shell here. You're not kind of going, God, we're going to kick into the court. We're going to kick long and we're going to make no mistakes and our own half. They were on the front foot from the word go and I think it was an exceptional performance. And I know Paul Willems has sent off, but I still say this with conviction Ireland are winning that game if even if Paul Willems uh, is is um, on the field for 80 minutes. Not by the same scoreline, but I think they're winning the game because mentally, physically, um, and from a tactical point of view, they were on it the other night. And that was probably the key going into the game. That was the question mark that we all had. Both these teams suffered horrendous, disappointing losses in the quarter final. How would they psychologically be you know, sport is about picking yourself up back up off the ground and it's difficult at times. And this Irish team were badly affected after that World Cup because we genuinely had a team for the first time ever in my involvement in playing in World Cups and commentating in World Cups. We genuinely, it, was, it wasn't like Ireland being cocky. We had a team that were good enough to actually win a World Cup. You need a few breaks. South Africa, wonderful side. Unbelievable players, but they got their bit of luck in that quarterfinal against France. England had them beaten in a horrific semi-final, um, and they got their luck. We, you know, it deserted us. So my point is, um, this is a very good side, and and it's very it's heartening to see that the couple of players that have come in. This is Robbie Henshaw. I thought he was exceptional at thirteen. Everyone was fearful that, got like. With respect to Robbie, he's a, has been a, such a consistently good player for so long. Uh, he's a British and Irish lines line twice, um, but Ringrose has that kind of magical dancing footwork, and he has been really central to Ireland's attack in the last two years. So there was a little bit of a fear there. No Johnny Sexton, um, and I just thought the way they coped was exceptional. And I keep saying it, um, you know, people. <sighs> Do the Irish coaches deserve a bit of criticism for, for, for the World Cup loss? Possibly in a sense that maybe they should have rested players more. That's the only thing that I could look at and say. Some people were saying, well, Jack Crowley should have come on with 20 minutes to go. Hindsight's a great thing. You know, I don't think that Ireland team were fatigued in that quarter final. That's my opinion as a player. You know, they were well rested, well prepped going into that tournament. Um, I don't think fatigue was the issue. When you lose the game, people can pick holes in it. So, you know, I think Andy Farrell, has, he has been amazing. And I think he's very central to what the mentality was of that Irish team going out the other night. They were like a group of people who were comfortable, uh, recovered from the disappointment, but also very determined and inspired. So, you know, look, it's uh, it heals some of the wounds from the World Cup. That's still going to be there. But... They can't change that now. It's This is the next thing. People are asking me in the build-up to this French game. Oh, sure, it doesn't really matter. It's hard to get up for this. It's a bit of an anti-climax. Yes, true, true, true. But as a sports person, it's the next thing involved. You can only learn from the past. The disappointment is there. But you know, you're now going into a cauldron in the south of France. You have two options here. You can sink or swim. And they swam and they, they performed brilliantly. So... 
nearly frustrating. Uh, Matt is talking about there was a good few in the hotel across the road from the hotel the other, or from the stadium the other night and uh, I think Drico said it's at one stage, you know, it's nearly more frustrating and more disappointing because they proved tonight that they're an exceptional team. And um, But it is what it is. I think they co- all the coaches deserve credit and the players for it. Um, and they put themselves in a real good position now. Um, they won't want us saying it, but um, no team has ever won back, back, back-to-back Grand Slams in the, in the Six Nations in the modern era. And they have a chance to be the first team to do that. And they should they should expect to do it if that's their standard. Um, it's going to be difficult and they may you know, have a, a few stumbles along the way because um, it's not, it's not, but they're favourites to do that now and um, I think it's, it's really pleasing that start on Friday night. Certainly is. Matt, uh, a man we talked about, probably one of his biggest games in Ireland shirt, if not, sorry, the biggest so far, Jack Crowley. After a shaky start, he came back and had a good second half and a pretty good game in general. What did you make of Jack Crowley steering the ship from minute one to 80? It's a, I think I think the the whole thing about the Irish psyche, as Alan was talking about, was a very positive psyche. But we we tend the Irish people tend to talk in absolutes. And you can hear what Queen was saying there. You know, it was a complete it was failure at the World Cup. It, the the World Cup failed because of the, the gap, the distance of Jordy Barrett's hand under the ball when Kelleher scored a try. Um, the the whole thing, you know, the, the Jack Crowley thing. He is fantastic, and he is. He played really well. He's the answer he was going forward. It's not an absolute on Jack. It's not an absolute on Joe, McC- on Joe McCarthy either, even though they both played well. If we come back to Jack, uh, so many positives. He'll get, keep the jersey. He'll keep going forward. Uh, if your team, as I said before, your team scores five tries, the, the nine and ten are doing something right, even though the forwards are laid it down. Jack has some things to work on, and... This is not a negative he, because he is not the finished article. Let's not compare uh, a young man in really the only the second season, the really second season of his professional career. I know he's belonged to that, but the last last season and this season uh, are really where he's flourished and, and he's getting his, consistently getting starts at 10 uh, for his province and, and for his national team. That is where you learn and he is learning. So he, he and I'm going. To, I'm, I'm not being negative. I'm just stating what he's done. If we look over the, the games Jack has played, he did a bad drop kick, a shot at, at drop goal against uh, South Africa, a bad chip against Scotland. He did got charged down, poor decision to do a grubber and kicked out on the full. So he has to work at his decision making on his kicking. We saw him drop a goal for, for Munster to win that semi final. We saw him do a crossfield kick for Gary Ringrose to score a try in that same Scotland game. And we saw him kick magnificently. A couple of great punts that set up the mall, the mall tries that Ireland scored on the weekend. He kicked absolutely beautifully for touch. Even though he missed one right in front, he kicked beautifully from the sideline, right in front of where, where I was sitting. So Jack can kick. It's when he kicks and what he chooses, his kick selection that he has to work on. So is that a reason to drop him? Absolutely not. But that's what the young man has to work on. The second thing he has to work on, and again, I'm going against myself, I'm saying it's what Sexton used to do. Every time Sexton took the ball, he was doing what you tell the littlest player in rugby to do, run onto the ball. So when you go down to the under eights, I remember my son was playing with down to the under eights, he's saying to all the kids, don't stand there and wait for the pass, mate. Run, and then we'll pass it and you catch it as you run. A 10 must do that every time. A 10 must run onto the ball, be square. What does that mean? Run straight, get your hips parallel with the, with the try line, the 22 and the halfway. Why do you do that? Because then you're a threat. And if you're a threat, you attract defenders. Two, and, and then you can pass, run, or kick. The triple threat, your, your pass, run, or kick is your triple threat. That's what a 10 should have every time. And too many times Jack was standing still, and that's getting his depth wrong. And that's, again, that's what he's going to learn, getting his depth wrong, catch, pass without going forward. So what, what am I saying? I, I think that was, without doubt, a success, success for Jack. No, no two ways about it. But let's also 
just acknowledge the reality. Let's not be absolutists. You know, the, the other absolute, Ireland can't play against big packs. That, now, that, that, they beat in South Africa twice and France twice in a row. So let, that's a myth that's gone. You have a bad day, you don't play well. So let's, that, that people were saying this was an absolute. Was, Ireland cannot play against big packs. And that's crap and it's dead. So let's not get absolute with Jack. Let's give the young man some time. Let's understand he is learning. He is a work in progress, but he is hugely promising. And I thought he, he should come out of that game, especially mentally. And I thought the, the mental side, what Quinny was saying about the coaches, the mental aspect of the Irish play, the coaches deserve great credit. And no more than, than, than Crowley, who made mistakes early on, and most or many young players would go, oh, I'm making mistakes. I kicked out in the full, grubbing it, I got charged down. That young, I missed a kick right in front. That young man put it all behind him and just got on with the game and played really well. So there was a huge, and, and let me tell you, that was in a very, very hostile environment. He comes home to the beauty of the Viva, family going to be there, people cheering him on. The, the history that the Viva has, he'll go much better. But that, Jack, is a work in progress, a positive one, and he'll keep going forward. But like the whole Irish team, there is not absolutes about this team, and we shouldn't have absolutes about anyone. So, so I, 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 I've been thinking about this since the game because people were just saying, now we've got McCarthy, oh, we can handle every pack. No, you can't. You've got to take it week, week by week, game by game. Quinny's right, their favourites to do the, what no one else has done and win back-to-back Grand Slams, and I think they can do it. But that is a week-by-week proposition. Once you go too far ahead, you fail. Quinny, Matt touched on him there at the end of his sentence there. Big Joe McCarthy, player of the match. Do you pick player of the match, by the way? But no, simply, no, the, how no. good was he? He was ridiculous on and off the ball, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, and, and um, I, said, I said it a few weeks ago. I'm not looking for any credit in that, but I just thought what I'd seen from Joe McCarthy um, in recent times with Leinster and the the power and and the athleticism he has, that um, he has to start. It's a case of who plays with him. Um, So, yeah, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. He's abrasive. He's physical. Um, You run at him, he's... If he doesn't smash you in a technique tackle, he's lifting you up and... You know, if you're on a pick and go around the side of the rock, he's lifting you and nearly carrying you back on the other side. It stops the whole flow of the game. So you you talk about players, and I've always said this about back rowers. I know I played there, but if you've a disruptive back row in your team, they can destroy the opposition if they're on it, and if they're they can affect so many things because they're nearly close to the ball all the time. Do you know what I mean? Like you get the turnover. You have the tackle technique, you have the wrap tackles, you have holding people up in malls, you have carries. They're the guys in the middle of that 1-15 to 15 that have so many involvements throughout the game. Um, and Joe McCarthy, obviously when you get athletic forwards and footballing and uh, uh, ball carrying second rows and stuff that like that, it adds more to your game and every coach loves that. The more ball carriers you have in the pack, the better. But the more aggressive, abrasive defenders... Poachers, um, look at Marshawn and Malvaca, how good they've been for Toulouse and France, poaching, poaching, poaching all the time. It stops the flow of the game. So we now have a guy who can have, you know, major influence on the flow of the opposition. You can be on the racks and, and Joe McCarthy has the ability. I know Tyburn is brilliant, so I'm not trying to pick out one guy here. I'm just, because, you know, Tyburn has come up with incredible turnovers um, Josh van der Fleer, Doris, you know, they, they're turnover kings, they're brilliant. But we now have a guy that's um, incredibly powerful. He can lift people back out of out of that combat zone, if you like, and and then he's a real strong carrier. So if you look at the last 20 minutes of the New Zealand game, whenever he came on, 15, 20 minutes, he made two or three carries and it was like, Jesus, he's gone through um, all black defenders. Um so he is that just that, that explosive power that gives gives them something different, and it's not just that because I think he's fit, he's a footballer, um, so there's many involvements throughout the game from Joe McCarthy and uh, Paul won't mind me saying this. A number of years ago, we, he spoke to me about Joe. I remember Mar- Paul was in helping the under twenties four or five years ago, and he was doing a bit with them, and we'd often chat. And I remember, I just remember Joe McCarthy coming up and um, 
he's he's really excelled. And here's a guy like a lot of people didn't know his story. He was on the third or fourth in school, you know what I mean? He wasn't a standout in school's rugby at all. So it's also a great message. I said it to my own son and, and his mates. You don't have to be a star school's rugby player or, or a star club player to, you know, when you, bec- when you grow up and you become a man and you get into your 20s. John Hayes, another great example, only started playing rugby at 19. He's 124 caps for Ireland and two Lions tours. So Joe, Joe is... Um, it's 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 a real good story, and uh, it was lovely to see him with his brother after the game and his family. That was really special. But look, he won't want any of that attention. He went out, did his job, and um, did it brilliantly. He certainly did, and hopefully have another ten years in the Irish jersey plus more. But Matt, we must move on to this Sunday, Ireland Italy. Would you expect many changes, or will it will it be the same fifteen, or would you say he'll change a couple up? Well. well it- uh, Stu, let's let's start by saying uh, Andy Farrell and his staff got their selections absolutely spot on for the match last week at the Velodrome. Give them a lot of credit for their for their selections. The, the most influence a coach can have on the game is the people they select to run on the field, and that whole selection was correct from the bench right through every player that came on really contributed. Now the, I think they'll pick the same team. The the only uh, only question I've got that that you might know, uh, uh, Quinny, is, is Calvin Nash fit? Because he came off with a very bad limb. It looked uh, like a dead I leg. I think he was walking around yeah. afterwards, so I don't know. Um, they, they... Yeah, he, he was taped up with ice on his quad. I thought the same thing. Yeah, it was a dead they leg. They walked around the eye. He was limping badly. So I, I think if they all recover, if Nash recovers, I, I would say it's the same selection. And I think he would be the only, the only possible change, as uh, 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 barring injury, because um, that that was a very good side. And the last thing, the very last thing, and the only thing that will bring Ireland undone, and I don't believe it'll happen, is if they take uh, this Italian side uh, lightly. So, and I know I don't believe they will. They've never done it in the past. The fact you look at the World Cup, they put 80 points on Romania. That's showing great respect for your opposition, but playing your best and doing your best. I don't see any reason why that would happen. But again, um, Nash Nash was in serious pain. Whether he can recover, he's got an extra couple of days because they played on Friday and it's a Sunday game. But that would be the only one that I see. And and, uh, to to add to that, um, I, I also think that the... The fact that they keep combinations together now does Gary Ringrose come in? Well, I think that is that is a real dilemma because I agree with Quinny. Robbie Henshaw was absolutely outstanding. Um, the, the, it's really interesting looking across the teams. Specialist thirteens are, are seem to be becoming a rarer commodity in the Northern Hemisphere, and real quality ones. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe Gal Ficku is a specialist thirteen. I think he's a twelve that. Play. It's like Robbie Henshaw, he's a 12 that plays very well at international level at, as a 13. So real top quality 13s are rare. And and developing, uh, I know Robbie Henshaw has played there a lot, but I, I thought that's the best game I've ever seen Robbie play in a 13 jersey. If Ring Rose is fit, that is a question for sure. Will that also affect the 6-2? Will they go back to a 5-3 on the bench if, he, if Ring Rose comes in and Henshaw, or, or one of them, they might keep Henshaw and put Ring Rose on the bench. Would that come in back to a 5-3 bench against Italy? That's a, that's a distinct possibility, a distinct possibility. You know what all those are? Really good dilemmas. Really, yeah. really good dilemmas yeah. as a coach. You know, you look at their going, wow, do I pick Ring Rose? Do I pick, do I pick Henshaw? Do I go over a 5-2 or 6? You know, Ireland's in... in Good shape at the moment and coming back home. Remember, it's been a long time. Uh, I know they played a game at the Aviva as a warm-up game for the World Cup, but they don't really count. So it, it's close to a year since they've had a game at home and I, I think they'll want to put their best team out there and um, and show what they can do. Yeah, well, we see what Timmy picks on. Oh, two things, actually. Nash, what a debut he had, you know, the, the try and so assured. But also Italy, you know, we must briefly touch on them. Running in close, yes, they scored a late try, but they did look a bit better. Yeah, they're, they're, um, they know each other inside out. I think they, they had, um, 
you know, a good start to a good, decent Six Nations last year. They caused teams a lot of problems. They caused Ireland some problems in Rome and and France in that first game. So, their attack is is something that's you've got to be very mindful and wary of. Um, they did call, cause England problems, and they had a lot of line breaks as well. And so I think, yeah, I don't think Ireland can underestimate them in any way. They won't, and that's just a given. They won't. Um, regarding the Ireland selection, I'd probably rotate the bench and throw a lot of the bench in into the starting team and take out a core group of them. The chances are Andy Farrell would want to keep this kind of togetherness and try and build on it. Um, because if, if you make changes, then potentially guys don't have... They've won game in three or four weeks. You know, when you think there's another break after, there's a break after this game, then there's a game against Wales, and then there's another break before the last two games. So um, it's a fair... You know, you could have one or two games in four or five weeks for some guys. So look, who knows? Um, I thought the impact off the bench was really exceptional. Uh, Kelleher, Healy, Bealham. Brilliant in the scrum when they came in. You know, Keane Healy, I often think about him. He's 36. Um, he's 126 caps now. I would not be surprised if this fella is at the next World Cup because he's that really? kind of an athlete and, and, be 39 and then? freak of really? nature really in the most respectful yeah. way. He's just freakish. Um, but like... You know, brilliant impact off the bench from from those guys. James Ryan, Baird, Conan was superb. Um, good dilemmas, as Matt said, and and um, Conor Murray and Frawley, all on positive night. You know, it's different if you're bringing all these guys on and you're ten points down or you're seven points down or whatever. But there's a possibility, a couple of rotations on the bench. But um, who knows? Scotland, Wales, Matt, <laughs> talk to me. Game of two halves, as they say. Scotland very good in the first half. Then Wales, you know, young side. Gatlin said in the first half was arguably one of his worst 30 minutes of coaching that's happened, or 30 years of coaching that's happened in that 40 minutes. But in the second half and 25 minutes, they were brilliant. Look, it finished 27-26 to Scotland. But your overall thoughts and summary of that game, Matt? I think if we take it from the Scottish point of view first, um, I think that really exemplifies... Um, this current Scotland side, that the talent is immense within this within that group of players. As I've often said, I I think it's the most talented Scottish team uh, over the last five years or four years uh, since the 1990s. You know when when they were winning championships. Uh, these are very talented guys, and I think Gregor's Gregor Townsend, the coach, his management of the group has been excellent. It is their mental, uh, we spoke about the mental strength of the Irish side, um, and I think it is the mental frailties of the Scottish side that, that gave you the extremes of that game. A brilliant first half and, and what was close to a catastrophic second half. Two yellow cards, a lack of intensity, um, a lack of direction, and, and it was just a real drop in, in mental uh, effort. Like They felt the game was won. Uh, especially after uh, Van der Lo- Lomu, as uh, as Robbie calls him, uh, uh, Van der Merwe scored the try just after half time to make it twenty seven nil. That they just relaxed. Now they're not the only team to have done that. They're not the first team to have done that. But good teams don't do that. Teams that win championships, as I said about Ireland, they Ireland kept their foot on the French throat. They didn't let them off. They didn't let them back in the game even though France scored that try just before half-time and came out and played positively for moments in that early part of the second half. Ireland didn't relent. The Scots did. And now if the Scots can master that mental side, and, and we've got to say the Italians are very similar. The Italians put in a really high-quality first half against England and then came out and mentally were poor. Unforced errors, drop, lots of drop passes, dumb penalties, uh, uh, poor lineouts, decisions, lost lineouts. Mentally, they dropped in the second half, as the Scots did, and, uh, and invited Wales back into the game. Now, that, I'm probably being a little bit disingenuous to the Welsh. They played much better in the second half, and we've got to understand that for 20 minutes of that second half, there were two Scottish players off in, in sin bins, but the Welsh did play better. But the, in my opinion, they played a lot better because the Scots invited them in. 
Now, Cardiff is a really tough place to go to, and the Scots don't win there very often. So we, we have to keep all those factors in play. If Scotland can mentally um, be far more determined, they, will, they, they should be, be a much more difficult side to beat. The problem is that they have th – this, um, this is not a new phenomenon. Now, remember a couple of years ago, uh, they, beat, they beat France in France beat, and beat in England at Twickenham, went home and lost to a really poor Wales. Now, now that, that's the type of thing we saw again last week, this mental high and mental low, emotional high, emotional low, that they have to somehow calm out. I, I'm not sure, like I'm not being part of the team, you don't know how they do it, but a talent is not their problem. Now, their forward pack aren't huge, but within the, within the six nations, they're, they're a very, very capable side. But mentally, they still have to keep that consistency that we saw they didn't have over one game. They've got to keep that over the two-month period. And right now, they're just, they haven't done it in the past. Hopefully, they can, they can show a little bit more of it in the future. Wales are, uh, are just lacking talent. Not, not courage, not effort, not, not, not uh, passion for their jersey. They're just lacking talent at the moment and experience. They've got a lot of players gone, a lot of old heads gone, and they're just, just really lacking in those key areas of talent and experience. Alan, it was Scotland's first win in Cardiff in 22 years. You see this week Ian Mulligan coping a bit of flack, just saying when he was asked in studio, you know, that second half performance, did that make Scotland, even though they got, they got the win, be a bit more, and he felt it was, they were more fragile. Do you think it's fair enough to get that flack or do you actually um, think they've won the game, it doesn't really matter? I think they've won the game and, and essentially it it's a different feeling. When you're as a player out there and you're winning a game comfortably and a team comes back and frightens the life out of you, you know, you could even see the reaction. It, it They weren't jumping around the place. If you'd given it to them before the, the game to win by a point, yes, they'd have taken their hand off. Um, I fancied him to win anyway, Scotland. Um, fragile is probably the some Scottish people will take offence to that but they're inconsistent and that's the reality and you know there's a lot of good players in that Scottish team and I had a real fear last year for Ireland and Murrayfield I remember thinking I think this Ireland are really going to earn it here it's going to be so difficult and, and will I, you still have fear in round five? Oh yeah of course yeah because I think they're very good players I think Ireland and, and I, I'd say this again it's not being cocky. The evidence is there for the whole world to see that this Irish squad and team have been really good and are still really good. And they're probably a level above most teams. Um, they're justified in the ranking. You know, in 2019, Ireland were number one for a while. It was very false ranking. Um, their ranking last year and, and now is, is actually where they're at. They're up there at the top two or three teams in the world and that's the reality yeah. you have to say that um, they've proven that Scotland are a team that are some brilliant players um, real quality when they get their kind of mojo going they can cause all sorts of problems for teams um, so you know even Ian saying fragile is like I wouldn't be taking that as an insult I, I'd be taking that as look I saw some stuff online from Scottish people saying that oh well you know we believe uh, we we've been accused of winning Grand yeah. Slams and we've been accused of being cocky and all this stuff. I don't think that he certainly didn't mean that because um, I think it's just that consistency and that's the reality of it. And um, there's there so much talent in that back line, oh, yeah. you know, isn't there? Phenomenal. Sorry, you never know, mind the forwards, phenomenal, but there is. Phenomenal. Um, unbelievable players in that Scottish team. Um, players that I would have massive respect for in a sense that I, I watch these guys a lot and I just go, wow, they're they're really, really good players. Um, it's just that consistency. So maybe it is a little bit of a mental thing, but maybe it's part of our journey in a sense of a lot of these ups and downs to get to a point where culturally they're they're they have a seamless transition when players come through into the into into the squad and stuff like that. And um on their day, of course they can beat anyone. Um but, you know, there's a few losses there and inconsistencies that they've just got to take on the chin. So, very dangerous side and a side that could could actually challenge for the championship. Even beforehand, we were thinking France, Ireland, Scotland are next, probably England. A uh, little bit unknown with England. Wales rebuilding and, you know, Italy, you know, and the evidence we've seen, they're... they're 
they're very dangerous but um, you know Scotland will have a big say but let's see now on Saturday they've got France at home they're going to t- be, be dealing with a real beast um, mode scenario from the French and I think France are you know you'd be asking us for predictions at the end but I think Scotland will get a real bounce off getting that win first time in 22 years as you said and it was a really positive day for Scotland Before predictions Matt England you know, they scraped over the line in Rome. Well, they got it done anyway. Scrape's probably a bit harsh. Did you see a wee bit more attacking sense that you liked? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you, you've got to give um, both with credit. I saw a great change from the World Cup in attack and defence. They really did try to play um, a more positive game. And and let's let's be real here. The tactics they employed at the World Cup are not going to beat the top four or five teams in the world. It will definitely beat the bottom teams, but you're not going to beat the top five teams by kicking away 94% of possession from your nine and ten, which they did against Argentina. Um, so they had, the, you know, the, if they didn't change, it was it was rugby suicide because they just can't beat the, the big sides. So they definitely did. They had a lot better shape. They they were trying to move the ball around. And, and it wasn't perfect because they hadn't done it for a, uh, just the first run out under a new system. And I get that, but they were definitely trying to do that. And I've got to say exactly the same in defence. Felix Jones has brought in, uh, who was South African, uh, obviously an uh, Irish native, played for uh, Leicester and Munster, coached uh, at, at Munster, went to South Africa, implemented a, a really devastating defensive system with a... Springboks, part of two World Cup wins. He's gone to England. Now, did it work on Saturday? Now, no, it didn't. Should we expect it to work on Saturday? Probably not, because it's not fair to think after, you know, one game that, and, I, and when at national level, you only get a few days with the players, that it would work. But part of the problem for England was that that system of compact players rushing up very fast leaves a lot of space between the last defender and the sideline. And Italy were able to exploit that in the first half. A couple of great tries. You've got to give the Italians um, a lot of credit. It was it was really uh, attractive rugby. But but Felix will have to fix that pretty quick, or it could be a grim a grim uh, tournament for them. Because if Italy are exploiting it, I can tell you the French and the Scots and the Irish will rip it apart. Um, the, the the second part of that was. Oh, they got away with a lot. I, I felt uh, the England were offside a significant amount of the time in that game and left unpunished. And I can pretty much promise you that uh, the, Scot- the uh, Welsh who are playing England at Twickenham this week will be pointing that fact out to the referees. You know, the English the English defence wants to rush, but it's got to stay onside. Mind you, the Springboks haven't, haven't been offside for years and got away with it. So why, why should we start penalising the English? But, but um that, that and, and, and it'd be unfair to suggest that that, that defence should work straight away week one. That, and that's not what I'm suggesting. They are in transition with their, both their attack and their defence. And I think both of it in the long term is a very positive thing. They will be vulnerable in this tournament until that bed's in. Now, defence is easier to bet in than attack. But, but right now they are vulnerable to both. And that they, um, they are fortunate. So England are pretty fortunate. If you look at their playing... The way it goes, they've got uh, Italy, Wales, Scotland, and then they step up. Ireland at home, France away. So, so you, you can see that they'll they'll have really uh, the the both the offense and the defense will have the best part of six weeks to be organised before they hit the two best teams in the tournament, and they will need that. If they had pulled Ireland last week or hit France last week, they would have. Um, they would have been burnt considerably because the space that they are leaving on the outside of their defensive line is just vast. It's vast at the moment. So a good few weeks for Felix to get his proper message across. I'll keep this brief, but the under-20s on Saturday, Oxon Provence, you were there commentating. Richie Murphy's done some job and they could make it, what, three three Grand Slams in a row? Yeah, was, they were brilliant um, up against a very powerful French side who, in reality, were missing some players, but... Uh, to the top 14 that was on at the weekend. So there was a number of players missing for them. Tua Lange was playing Friday night. He came off the bench. He could have been playing in that under 20s. But they have so many players to choose from. Um, very strong French team. There was still eight of them 
involved on, on Friday night that were involved in a World Cup winning squad in the summer. So they have so much power, quality. But this Irish team, yeah, surprisingly, um, not surprisingly, because like, I think um, that's unfair, but there's only like you, Gavin, Joe Hopes, um, Brian Gleeson, Brian Gleeson, Danny Sheehan and Evan O'Connell there from last year. The third, it's yeah. Kind of five. Mm-hmm. Um they were superb, Gavin, you know. Gavin, especially, yeah, you're a big yeah. Advocate. He was great. Um, you, Gavin, in the centre, unbelievable, phenomenal performance from him. Brian Gleeson, uh, Jack Murphy, Richie yeah. Son at ten. You know the kicking, the control. You could name all these yeah. players again. It's such a good win that there's so many of them s- stood out. Willem the Clerk at thirteen. What a player! Um, They'll say game at a time, but they will be looking for another. Clean sweep, would yeah, they? Or is, that too, is that too far? Yeah, it depends. You see, some of the 20s teams, there's a good bit of rotation. So France could make loads of changes. England had a big win against Italy. You know, you just don't know. Historically, under 20 coaches do make a number of changes. So um, it depends. But look, they're in a good position. Again, they've got to go, obviously, to you know the game away in England is, is a different proposition. You just don't know what you're going to get and the physicality of, of, of English underage teams. But... Brilliant start. Um, it's a big, big Irish pack. It was, you know, uh, Andy Ward's son was playing at seven. Uh, Matt mm. Bryn Ward. Um, good, good man, Andy Ward. Yeah, good, yeah. Good, so good some great players in that team, and the their bench is really good as well. So they took a few hammer blows, and uh, you know they just dusted themselves down every time France scored, and they went up and scored, and then you know some great performances it was a really positive result uh, for Richie Murphy's side 7 out of 7 with the yeah, they for play, Jack as they well play you know, fri- win the game yeah they play Italy on fr- Friday night in Cork and uh, Virgin Media Park unbelievable no? Virgin Media yeah. Park sorry <laughs> Virgin Media Park yeah I'll say that a few more times <laughs> Freddie Pucciarello's son is playing who who played the Argentinian who played with Munster he's playing 10 for the Italians on so Friday night. Just like his dad. Martino Pucciarello. <laughs> uh, so I can't wait. I'm going to meet Freddie there. And uh, I remember the kid as a, as a baby in Limerick, you know, and uh, he's now playing against Ireland. Uh, the other son, Bernardo, he definitely wants to come and play in Ireland and uh, he's not going to be donning any other international jersey if he's good enough. He was born in Ireland. Martino was born in Argentina, but... Um, that'll be interesting on Friday night anyway well we hope the under 20s all the best Matt predictions according to Quinny we got them all right last week I don't agree but anyway so Italy, Ireland England, Wales and Scotland, France Uh, Ireland uh, England Scotland, France is a very tough game to call Uh, I actually think the French are in a bit of trouble I actually do think the French are in a bit of trouble I was very surprised on Friday night the, the difficulty of predicting this is which Scottish team is going to turn up, the first half or the second half. If the first half team turn up, Scotland will win that game. If they don't, France will win it. So it's a, it's a real tough one to go. But I, I actually think an upset's on the cards and the Scots can, um, if they can put, put 70 odd minutes together, they can win that game. Because I, I think the French are really... And what are they going to, what are they going to do for the other 10, Matt? <laughs> You said 70. Mate, they can't That's fine. You can, yeah, OK, all right. So you're, he nearly, he nearly you're not, looking, you're not looking for perfection, like. You're saying 70 minutes no, will do it. I'm, I'm real. I'm a realist, mate. Always, always have been a realist. He's going to win Can't the Scottish fans out. back. Oh, yeah. He's trying to get the Scots fans back there, yeah. I know. Right, I'm going, oh, for, yeah. Three, I'm going for three home wins. Scotland, England, Ireland. Three away last week, three home oh, this week. Go. Lads, it's been a pleasure as another Six Nations round beckons. Don't forget to join us half one on Saturday afternoon for the build-up for Scotland, France on Virgin Media 1.